Hello. Hopefully, you are now familiar enough with the laws of thermodynamics to see, to see the two equations shown here, the first and second laws of thermodynamics, as old friends. You feel comfortable with the fact that the total energy of the universe is conserved at all times in accordance with the first law, and, although entropy is a bit mysterious, you are very taken with the remarkable intellectual achievement that the second law represents. It, together with the first law, represents common property of all the changes that are observed in the universe. Any processes that involve a change in entropy that is less than or equal to the integral shown on the right-hand side of this equation simply will not happen. This is profound and heady stuff indeed. We arrived at the laws of thermodynamics by considering the behaviour of steam engines, and in particular the expansion and contraction inside the pistons inside the engines. We argued that the expansion and contraction of the gas inside these pistons allowed us the engines to do work on the universe. What we have not seen, because of the lack of time, is the scale to which classical thermodynamics explains what we observe in the universe. With these two laws alone, we can explain chemical reactivity, the work that can be done by batteries, phase equilibrium, and even the processes of even cellular processes such as osmosis that are the main state of biology. Needless to say, the physicists who came up with this theory were pretty pleased with the result with the laws that they had introduced, and were excitedly applying this to every problem that they could think of. It was therefore upsetting when someone came along and fundamentally questioned their approach. The person who did this questioning was called Ludwig Boltzmann. His concern was that classical thermodynamics had been constructed by exploiting the calculus that had been developed by Newton. It struck Boltzmann, however, that the justification for doing this was not clear. It seemed to Boltzmann that this mathematics had been used because, well, that was the mathematics that was there. Scientists had been taken in by an illusion. Yes, the second law could tell you what processes would happen and which would not but it could not tell you why. I mean, we didn't even have an explanation of what entropy was. On top of these almost philosophical concerns, Boltzmann was around in a time when the notion that matter was composed of atoms was still controversial. Some segments of the com scientific community were convinced that this was the case, but others believed that atoms were not real or that an atomic theory was not necessary. Boltzmann came down squarely in the first of these two camps, what is more, he argued that calculus can be used within the context of thermodynamics precisely because matter is composed of atoms. These atoms, argued Boltzmann, would move in accordance with Newton's laws of motion. The problem, though, was that there were a vast number of atoms in any piece of matter. As such, solving Newton's deterministic equations for all the atoms in a lump of matter would be impossible. In solving this problem, Boltzmann thus argued that probability must be used in some way, and thereby introduced a whole new set of mathematical tools into the scientific canon. A very short and also modernised version of Boltzmann's argument ran as follows. Let's suppose we have some atoms. Boltzmann argued that the state of these atoms in Newtonian physics would be characterised based on the position and momentum of each of the atoms. He thus called each set of positions and momentums that the atoms could have a microstate of the system. The set of all possible microstates was then referred to as phase space. Here I show an example of a phase space for a very simple system. There are five possible microstates that this system could be in, and each of these is characterised by a different vector for the positions and velocities of each of the atoms in the system. In real applications, there are usually either an extremely large number of possible microstates, or an infinite number of possible microstates. It is thus difficult to provide a representation of phase space. The argument, however, when the number of microstates is enormous, runs similarly to the one I will present here, for this phase space with five microstates. Each of the microstates in phase space will have a value for the various extensive thermodynamic quantities. So in our five state example, each microstate has an associated value for its internal energy 
its volume and its number of atoms. Now suppose that I tell you that the total energy of the system is E. I know that energy must be conserved at all time because of the first law of thermodynamics. I can thus say with certainty that the system will never be in any microstate that does not have energy E. We say that some microstates become inaccessible as a consequence of this constraint on the total energy. For the simple example I have shown here, I have supposed that the two states that I have covered with blue squares are now inaccessible. The question now is what microstate does the system choose to occupy? In the simple example shown here, there are three microstates and all of these have energy E. Which one of the system, which one does the system choose to occupy? Boltzmann's answer to this was what led to the introduction of probability in statistical mechanics. He answered that the system does not choose. Instead, there is a finite probability that the system will occupy each of these three states at any given time. Rather than staying in one single microstate, it will fluctuate between all the microstates with energy E. Boltzmann's realisation is now referred to as the principle of equal a priori probabilities. A modern statement of this principle would explain that any system in equilibrium is equally likely to be in any one of the accessible microstates. Alternatively, we write, state this theorem as follows. If there are m microstates with energy E, then the system has a probability of 1 over m of being in each of them if its energy is fixed. From this intuitive and conceptually simple statement, the whole edifice of modern statistical mechanics is constructed. Within statistical mechanics, we find an answer of sorts to the question, what is entropy? And we better understand why the calculus can be used to understand the behaviour of a large ensemble of atoms. I will leave all that for a later video, though. For now, I will just finish by think thanking you for your attention and by asking you to ensure that you have understood the principle of equal a priori probabilities.